part of today's lecture, the last real part, uh, which has to do with the pairing and randomization. As uh, before we jump into the topic, let's look at this new example to make uh, a point about the difference in the situations now. Now it's another study. We want to compare two kinds of sleeping medicine, medicine A, medicine B. Now we have done the following experiments. We have taken this 10, we have taken 10 test persons and we have had them try sleeping medicine A, maybe first, and then after a while, we've taken the same persons and have them try uh, medicine B, right? And then we have a measure, for instance, when person A tried, and we, we don't have time to dig into and I don't even remember or recall or know uh, all the details behind it, we just have to understand the following. Person one, when having medicine A, improved 0.7 hours gained 0 0.7, 0 0.7 hours of sleeping using sleeping medicine A. The same person one gained 1.9 hours using medicine B. And here I hope you already see the big difference in the settings here compared to before. Before we had nine nurses in one group and nine uh, secretaries in another group. Here we have the same persons in the two groups, you could say. There are two columns of data but it's the same 10 persons that we have here. This shows really the two different ways, even though the nurses and, and, and um, secretaries was slightly different, it was more of an observational study. We didn't give them any treatment. They were not randomized to being a nurse or a secretary and then they had to go do it. However, this shows the difference that our uh, medical companies and doctors are in. When they do experiments on medicines, they have those two different ways of doing it. Either they do a completely randomized study, that's the most common one, not like this one, where they have some patients getting one treatment and other patients getting another treatment, because usually that's the only way it goes. You have one go and that's it. You cannot go, if you're seriously ill, you cannot go try one and then you wait. I mean, not as a part of an experiment, you don't do it if you're seriously and you do try many different things, but you don't do it as, as such as a part of an experiment. You would go try one thing and then you would go check how it worked on you. However, whenever possible, in less severe cases, such an experiment here is a very good idea, as I hope you will realize before we have finished in 10 minutes. Let's first of all think about how should we and could we analyze these data um, well, the big, and that is, co which is supposed to be under the heading, the paired t-test. The two sample paired t-test, it's paired, right? The data in one column is paired with the data in the second column. Because it's the same person, right? These two are paired, these two are paired. So that's why the two samples are paired compared to before where they were independent, now they are dependent, or in another word, they are paired. Well, it is very easily handled by what we already know. So I, we could, can do that very rapidly. Actually, what is done in practice when we have paired data is that we simply subtract the two from each other and only looks at the difference. That is, we only look at what is, maybe I, I jump. We simply transform these two numbers from person one into one number expressing that B was 1.2 hours better than A for this person, right? B was 2.4 hours better than A for person two. So we, we basically transform the two samples into a one sample thing and then I use what I taught you two weeks ago, right? Confidence intervals, hypothesis test. So that's it basically, that's, that's uh, what we should do here. We should, let me see if I skipped some important words here, I skipped a few words. Uh, we do talk about this because it's a very common situation, so it's kind of uh, given giving its, its own name. Uh, so we compute the differences, we compute the mean of the differences, we compute the variance of the differences, and then we move on in a, as in a single sample situation. Let's do it, and let's do it in R. So up here, I prepared, 
I prepared my sleeping medicine A, sleeping medicine B into X1, and then I simply compute the difference. Can you note something already now on the differences which were, these are the same differences which I showed you on in the table before. Do you get a hint about whether B is better than A or A is better than B by looking at these differences? Yeah, people are nodding. Why? Please? Because they're positive across the board. They're all positive. Good, good observation. And all, we may be 10 out of 10 positive. Well, basically, then almost I'm done. I wouldn't have to compute what is the 10 out of 10 and a 50-50 throw in a coin. Actually, such a test exists. That's the sign test, but I jump that for, for other reasons. 10 out of 10, that's very unlikely. That's a p-value, a small p-value. So probably there is an improve of b compared to a here. That is much clearer from looking at the differences compared to, let's do the t-test. Here, I simply use the t-test function on the differences, and you can see I get a one-sample test on the differences. I get a t of this. I didn't specify any one-sided, neither less nor greater. Should I? What was the story? Go back to the story, where it is. I want to compare two kinds of medicine. That's all the story I was given. I do know nothing. I know nothing about these two types of differences, right? So default is default is two-sided. So the result I reject, uh, what do I reject? I reject that mu d is zero. So b is better than a, because that's what I can see in the numbers, right? That was based on my very small p-value here, right? Also, the confidence interval tells me the same story that it does not include zero, right? The effect of the, the difference between A and B, or rather the improved effect of B compared to A, is somewhere between almost one hour up to two and a half hour. So somewhere within almost one and uh, up to two and a half hour is the improved effect of B versus A. Pretty have strong evidence based on a very small uh, experiment, actually. And on average, the improvement is one hour, 40 minutes. The, the, the additional improvement of B versus A, not the sleeping, not the absolute sleeping improvement. Now, can you see what, what happened here? Can you see what happened? I'm going to do a little exercise with you before we... I'm going to do a wrong analysis. I'm going to do the wrong analysis where I think of these data as if they came from another experiment where I had 10 persons doing sleeping medicine A and another 10 persons doing sleeping medicine B. I could have done such an experiment. That's a very common experiment out there to perform because, as I said sometimes, that's the only thing that makes practical sense to do such an experiment. Let me try to do this analysis. That is a non-paired situation, as if it was a non-paired. T-test. I simply plug in the two sets of uh, data in the t-test function. What is the result? The result is the same on the means. There is a 1.67 improvement of B versus A, of course. It's the same data. Look at the t now. <coughs> t statistic. 
Ah, I should just to make sure that I do what I told you today. I'll do it like this. I'll do it again. It doesn't make any real difference, but just to have exactly what I have shown you on the slides today. I get 18 degrees of freedom, that's 9 plus 9. I get a p-value of 7%, that is, I cannot prove that b is better than a, given those data. What is happening here? The p-value was very small on, based on the paired situation. Now, this is what we could expect to see from, an, from a non-paired experiment. If I actually performed an experiment with 20 persons, 10 plus 10, this is what I would accept, what I would expect to see, actually. So, actually I see it appears to be a much better idea to perform the paired experiment in this case. That's the one conclusion I hope you can follow. The paired experiment finds the difference which is there. The unpaired experiment doesn't find it. And the question is, why? What is the clue here? What is the point? Why is the paired experiment having a better performance? Any ideas? Let us look at the noise in the system that enters into the analysis. It's around a standard deviation of two on this sleeping improvement for A and standard deviation of two approximately for the improvement of B. What is the standard deviation of the difference? Whoa, that's almost half the size. The standard deviation, the noise that is used, the sigma, the S that enters the formulas in the T statistic has almost halved in the diff data compared to using the individual x1 and x2 data. Why? I mean, now we can see in, in numbers, we can actually, there's a bit more detail, but that's only degrees of freedom. This is the core difference between the, t, the test statistics that makes the difference-based test statistic become smaller because this sigma we put in becomes, sorry, the sigma becomes smaller, so the difference-based t-test statistic blows up to minus 3, whereas when we plug in the others, it's only minus 1 point something. The thing is, now you've had time enough to think about it. The thing is, there is an individual effect that has nothing to do with whether it's sleeping medicine A or B, right? Some persons, like, uh, like this one, and like uh, this one, are generally, and this one, person 6, 7, and 10, generally uh, have good uh, effects of sleeping medicine. Whether it's A or B, it doesn't matter. There are, there are individual variability that is large that goes across the two treatments. So these are persons that receive those type of treatments well. Other persons receive such treatments, generally speaking, less well. Right? So there is an individual, a biological variability, you could call it, or genetic variability or whatever, in how people receive those medicines. So, and this uh, individual variability plays a major role if we have different persons in the different uh, groups, then this individual variability will play the role, an important role, of, of the variance in the system. Whereas we can remove it when we take the difference, then it doesn't matter whether they are high or low, we just focus on the difference, right? So individual variability is removed from the system in paired experiments. That is why, generally speaking, they are better, at least whenever such individual heterogeneity exists, which you encounter and expect in many cases. I mean, medical are based on our, our genes in a way that we receive them. Question? If you had a high number of people still, yeah. yeah. Still for a high number of people, it's better. But I mean, it's, most medical studies out there are not like this because it's not possible. But whenever you can, it's a good idea. Okay. I have a question as well. One more question. Uh, can you show me the slide 
slide of uh, the A and B and B problems. So what if all the elements of A would be negative and all the elements of B would be positive? Then the noise of the D column would be greater than the one of A and B. Would it still make sense to make the pairing? Not uh, necessarily. The question is, what if all A's are negative? What if all B's are positive? That doesn't necessarily make the sigma spread, the sigma D spread high. That just shifts the average effect, what you're say saying there. That would just say that all people get worse on A and all people get better on B. And that would just increase the average effect, actually. I think we have... Uh, We'll jump to the last part. We make a jump. I do it in no more than five minutes, I promise you. <laughs>